Welcome everyone to our film discussion of the 2020 SPIF Narrative Feature Best Award for our own with Jean Leblanc, the director. We are also joined by Sienna Sophia Burt, the director of Opia, which had its world premiere at 2019 SPIF. Hi, and thank you so much for joining us, Jen. I'm so excited to get to talk to you about our own. I also wanted to give, before we jump in, um, just a little bit of background on your career and um, just a quick blurb of the film. So Les Notres, or Our Own, is the story of a small insular community's response to 13-year-old Magali's unexpected pregnancy. And as I was watching it, I kept thinking, um, people who enjoyed the 2012 film Electric Children might enjoy this as kind of a more intimate and darker take on that subject matter of um, mysterious or unexplained young pregnancies. And this is Jeanne's second feature following her feature debut with 2018's Isla Blanca. So I'm so excited to get the opportunity to talk to you about this film. I really enjoyed it and I found the characters extremely compelling. Um, but I wanted to start out by asking you actually about the opening shot of the film, which, um, you know, openings can tell you so much or conceal so much about the movie that you're about to see. And I found myself as I was watching the film, really getting the sense that you were inspired really heavily by art history. Um, and particularly in both the poster and that opening shot of the film where Magali is sitting on a bed facing away from the camera and she's sort of draped in this, um, in the, these beautiful flowing bedclothes and she's starting to look over her shoulder. Um, it just read so much like almost a Renaissance painting to me and it certainly reminded me of um, the Manet painting Olympia. So I was curious if there were particular pieces from art history that you were drawing on for that and if so whether you could talk to us a little bit about those inspirations. Um, I think the first first inspiration before to get through all the masterpiece, art masterpiece, um, I, I really passed a, a long time looking at David Hamilton picture. You remember in the 70s, um, mm -hmm. there's this famous photographer who just uh, take like movie picture inspired by Renaissance painter. Um, about those young lady, mm -hmm. um, pre, uh, pre teenager, and it was really disturbing picture when you look at it in two twenty, uh, in twenty twenty. Sorry, but at that time in the seventies, everybody got that picture at their place. Everybody got a David Hamilton picture. Everybody just look at it. Wow, it's a beautiful. It's part of. So it's a really cultural thing when you think about it. So I, I, and 30 years later, he was uh, accused by his models to, uh, to abuse them. And then he committed suicide at 85 before to be judged. So that's really an interesting story telling a lot about the silence. So it's really meta, <laughs> it's a story in the story because the, all the parents of all those young ladies said he was famous. Everybody knew at that time that he was a little bit suspicious, but the parents were so proud to send their teenagers to be David's and Milton models. So they even not questioning what, what it was about. So it's totally the right. story in the story. So, and it's uh, when, when you read all, all the texts, all the pedophile texts are, are uh, from the guy, are just Lolita, just to start by this one, but then you have many, many, any uh, good liter literature <laughs> about this. And it's always this uh, image of uh, not just natural, but pure. And the mm -hmm. men who are attracted by those teenagers feel as pure as them. So it's kind <laughs> of really twisted mind. And they will say, I am more pure and more authentic and more real than the real man because I can right. see the pure and the beauty and the um, innocent beauty. So it was all that mm -hmm. philosophy in the, 17, in the 70s and the, the 80s and the 60s also that was acceptable. 
There's a famous right. film with uh, with Vanessa Paradis, and um, I don't remember his name, but uh, it was the love story of a young woman, uh, like 14 years old, with her teachers. And it wasn't um, in question at that time, but when you see right. this film, it's 20 years ago, 20, 25 years ago. When you see this film now, it's so disturbing, but the, the mentality changed so fast, but it didn't change enough or didn't change very right. fast. <laughs> So um, it's a story in a story for, for this first shot. We really, really do big research after that for uh, all the inspiration of David Hamilton to find the Renaissance picture. But the first inspiration was David Hamilton picture. So. Oh my goodness. I love that. And thank you so much for explaining that. It sort of adds so much richness to that opening shot, especially given um, you know, I don't want to reveal too much about the plot here, but the role that the character of the mayor plays in your story and um, the power dynamics involved in that in terms of, as you're talking about, when somebody's famous, there's sort of a sense, particularly in an insular community, that they can do no wrong. Um, yeah. So thank you and so much for They are kind of that. pure and they are, they feel oh. kind of pure and yeah. Right. There's that lack of guilt almost. Um, so on a kind of similar note, one of the other visual aspects of this film that really jumped out at me was um, there are a couple of key points where you have these close-up shots that instead of showing the character's face, cut them off at about um, shoulder level and show just their lower torso. Um, and I honestly can't think of another film I've watched that's done that and I found it so effective for both conveying the narrative and sort of tying into the story you're telling but also just giving this very visceral sense of putting us in close contact with the characters bodies so I'd, I'd love to hear a little bit about how you came to that framing choice and what you intended for it to convey. <laughs> um, there, there was two main line for the framing choice. One was the frame in the frame that you, you get this right. small, every time sense of to be boxed in something. You can be boxed in your mm -hmm. own um, perspective of life, but you can be boxed in so many things. So if, if you look at all the shots, there's always box in box. So um, we wanted mm -hmm. to make sure that the audience feel like the character you see what you want to see or you hear what you want to hear mm -hmm. and you won't see what you don't want to see so if right. for example, <laughs> i put this this type of shot i can imagine this is the only thing that i give you to look so it's right. and it's it may be the only thing that the other character are looking at and the interesting thing in this uh, then sequence i start one shot with the torso and I remember the makeup uh, girl because we did a really huge uh, crew casting to make sure that it was 50 person uh, woman, 50 person men, that there will never be any flirting on set. It was a huge mm -hmm. thing for me. And I remember this makeup girl and everybody was aware that we want a really ethical shooting. So, mm -hmm. And there was this uh, makeup girl and a friend of mine and she said, the most interesting thing in that shot if it's I forgot they were teenager and I found it sexually attractive. And it right. placed me in a really, really weird situation where for a beat, like just two seconds, as an audience, I feel it sexually attractive. And then you show me the face. And then I'm just like, no, 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 she's a teenager. Mm -hmm. She's 13 years old. Stop yeah. it. And she said, it's so disturbing cause, because for a few seconds, I feel it, wow, it's a beautiful lady. It's a, and this is all the way we are looking at things. And the, cam the, the camera, it's the way all the other characters are looking at each other or don't look at each other, if, if I may say. So yeah, that, that was really important for me to just put in perspective. We always see what we want to see. And is, uh, mm -hmm. as a spectator, Tater, you feel a little bit disturbed. That's mm -hmm. normal. Well, and I, I love that you brought up Lolita in that context too, because I had a very similar feeling watching those shots to reading the novel in the sense that you are placed into the perspective of the predator. And for at least as long as that shot lasts before you see whose face you're looking at, um, 
you are seeing through that viewpoint and through those eyes and um, it makes you question yourself in these really interesting and disturbing ways, um, which is actually sort of the next thing I wanted to ask you about. Um, uh, another place where I was really struck by your use of framing was um, in the few webcam scenes. And I know as film has sort of adapted to the existence of this video technology that we're using right now, um, we've seen a lot of different sort of attempts to integrate it that have been um, successful or unsuccessful to varying degrees. But I really appreciated that you um, didn't fill the frame with the webcam or with the computer screen. You let us see a little bit of the environment around that screen that the characters are concentrating so that you have almost three layers of framing in each one of those shots. Um, you can never just dive into the, the particular visual that's carrying the plot forward. Um, and I found that really effective and I'd love to hear a bit more about how you came to that choice and any advantages that you might have felt it provided you. Um, I should say, and I will just thank my editor, uh, Ophelia, I think we passed at least three days just that in bits and pieces, but if, if I merge all the hours we pass in this particular uh, sequence, we pass at least three days on this because we really wanted to switch at the really right moment when the perspective of the character switch. So when you <laughs> feel like involved in the conversation, like there's no screen anymore, or when you just feel a little bit like off screen, and when you feel really off screen, because you've got the same sensation when I'm talking to you, if, if I'm really involved in the conversation or in the question, I will forget this. But if at some point you ask right. me something a little bit, uh, I will just step out and then I will see my screen and I won't forget that I'm on Zoom. So, we passed at least three days question, uh, questioning every time which per perspective are we in. So are they really connected or when they started to disconnect? Um, mm -hmm. So it was a real conversation and my editor was amazing because I filmed it in that, that way saying to myself, oh, it's really evident. It's at this sentence they are in, at this sentence they are out. But in real life, when you start editing, it changed. <laughs> so, yeah. yeah. <laughs> oh, I love that. One, um, I was actually just about to ask you a bit more about your experiences working with um, some of the other creatives on your team. I was particularly interested in sort of the way you pick apart the town's racism through the perspectives of different generations of character as the film progresses and as we start seeing how um, the mothers versus the other children at school are reacting to Magali's allegations against Manuel. And um, given that the script was co-written by the actress who plays Manuel's foster mother, right? Um, yes. I, I'd love to hear a little bit more about how the two of you worked together to create um, within the script and within the text particularly, um, those varying perspectives of the town's bias and the town's um, sort of dangerous insularity. Yes, <laughs> it's the right way to say that. Um, I should say that for each character, we, we decided to put in perspective so many things. It, there's so many gray line. Uh, there's mm -hmm. nobody totally guilty or totally non-guilty because right. I think those, why, one reason why um, there's not so many uh, person will just, uh, it's, uh, in Quebec it's 10% of all the, uh, the um, abuse are denunciate. I'm sure my sentence doesn't make sense, but yeah. So there's 13% uh, of denunciation. So we start with that thought, it's a long sentence, but we start with that thought saying all those characters are really complex and all those mm -hmm. people couldn't be that simple. This is right or, or wrong. And this is the same thing for everything in our life. So for Chantal, she's got this, the way we created it, she's got this really hard shield and she cannot break. Mm -hmm. If she's breaking, mm -hmm. there's nothing inside. So she needs to put mm -hmm. it together. So she will go 
where her husband will go. She will go where the society will go because if she cracks, she will fall apart. So, mm -hmm. and that way for all the racism in the film, um, there's the subtle racism, just the one that the, the ordinary one, the one with the little sentence, yeah, we know he's good at soccer because he's Mexican, blah, blah, blah. And then That's you right. have the other one. <laughs> The second step, when we started to say, he's not like us. And then mm -hmm. the third step for Chantal, what it, what it is to be like us. Is she like mm -hmm. her husband? And if she's not, she will just fall apart. So it's all this mm -hmm. psychological construction that you need to do step by step. And that was interesting because you did, who is the mm -hmm. co-writer, she knows that, but she she really switched her hat. She never was the script writer when she played Chantal. She really, mm -hmm. Our images was uh, Jackie Kennedy. So she is Jackie Kennedy at the beginning of the film. And then she started to fall mm -hmm. apart. So all the gesture, all the hair, all her clothes mm -hmm. are really stiff, like Jackie Kennedy in the young year. year. Mm -hmm. Sorry. And then she started to crack, but she needs to pull it together. So I think the racism, but also the way she will react to all the, the, mm -hmm. the doubts and all that stuff. It's just a way to just keep it tight. So, yes. Right. Oh, I love that one. It sounds like it was such a fruitful collaboration for the two of you. Um, it, it, it was, so yeah. Cool. Um, I, I love hearing about that. And I... Um, on that topic, I was, uh, after I finished watching the film, I spent a little bit of time sort of sitting and processing it. And I felt like coming out of the film, um, the title felt even richer than it did going in, in terms of, you know, as the story goes on, we see um, both this personal narrative of Magali's struggle to find a sense of kinship with her child. And at the same time, um, this uh, sort of societal narrative of the town trying to define what it means to belong to it and what it means to be one of our own. Um, so I'd, I'd love to just hear a bit about how you came to that title and what it means to you. Um, there was one character, you know, the neighbor, the um, Marie-Ginette, the Madame Tremblay, the neighbor. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> she says at, at some point in the, the party, she said, the, all, the, all this story, it's not us. And we started to mm -hmm. think about this, such an ordinary sentence that we heard everybody in our family, in our work, mm -hmm. and this is not us. This, this, is, mm -hmm. this cannot be us. So we started to, to talk about it, which is it, saying, if it's not us, what is it? And then we started mm -hmm. to think about about what it's this um, sense of this is a th this is us and this is the others, but we heard it in our yeah family, uh, coworker and in everywhere we will hear it. So the the title comes from Madame Tremblay when she will say that, mm -hmm. and then we started to think about what does it mean. So our own, it's just it's us, not the other. So and with all so was, the problems that comes with. Right. So this was a title that came to you after you'd already developed the script then? Yes. That's and so from cool. one of the character. Oh, I love that. Well, because it, it's, it's such a perfect title and it encapsulates so much about the story you're telling and the, the themes it's addressing. Um, I think it's just brilliant. So I'm, that's so cool to hear that that came about in the work. Um, I also wanted to ask what you're working on next and whether there's anything we should be looking out for in the video. I hope, yes. <laughs> uh, in, in reality, uh, the, the thing is, I was working on um, TV series and developing a TV series and a feature film, but as, as you know, in the COVID world, it's really hard to do film with sensitive subject or subject, I had one idea in between Tunisia and here, because I think I, I really work a lot about identity problems. So in different, mm -hmm. uh, in different 
world. But um, I, I'm, I'm right now starting to switch a little bit to, to do a more intimate film with the same subject. But mm. I should say in the COVID world, it's really hard to just switch like this because I, I know I'm not the only mm. one. But I think when, when you have one, one thin line, uh, it's similar from one film to the other one. So for example, mm. I just... Uh, discover that I really love to work about identity issues, who you mm -hmm. are in your society, in your world, in your family. Mm -hmm. So I just reframe my old project to make sure that it will fit in a COVID world, but also fit in what I ne really need and want to do about uh, the world. Yeah. Oh, cool. Oh, well, I, I hope everything works out well with getting this project back on its feet with the... Thanks event of COVID. Um, I can't wait to see what you're working on next. I truly loved this film and I love getting to hear you talk about it. I, um, I have a lot more questions for you if we have more time, but I just want to check in and see how we're doing on the clock, whether we have a little more time to, to go or... Um, yeah, maybe let's you need to... uh, do another question or two and then wrap it up. Sounds good. So, Another um, another point in the film that stood out to me, um, you know, this is a piece that for the most part stays pretty rooted in reality, but there's this one intriguing moment towards the end where Manuel sort of appears out of the bonfire smoke, almost like a ghost with this blue backlighting and then he disappears again. Um, and I was hoping that you could tell us a bit more about not just what that image meant to you, but how it might have sort of opened up a bit more room in the story, which is a story that kind of starts out as a mystery for the audience, to hold a different and maybe more flexible relationship to the idea of, of truth. Um, I, I, I think for in the first writing, it wasn't, it was more instinctive. It's those type of mm -hmm. images that you're just like, I think it, it goes in the film, but I cannot right now explain why uh, there's also mm -hmm. the, the other images when they they wake up the two of them taking um the the they are just we see just their back and they're taking their mm -hmm. ends uh it was one scene that i had in the morning and i just asked the crew to don't ask me why don't tell me why it goes in the script we will shoot it it will take 15 minutes just just follow <laughs> And it will be good. Uh, it's first. It was instinctive images because I think at that part that at the start of the story, Maggie started to get contact with something a little bit more unconscious or more um, mm -hmm. some things that she cannot name. So all her life mm -hmm. was structured by her mom, by by all the other person, and then she started to loosen up. And when she listened up, some things happen. Like, like mm -hmm. it did in real life. Sometimes we are so tight, so control freak, and then right. we listen up a little bit and some things happen that we didn't expect. So it was in this, um, in this, I don't know, something in, in the air, in the air, so, so, sorry, something in the air that I wanted to show up. And I really love this, just this little quick moment, this image of Manuel coming in when she started to loosen up and then we can mm -hmm. start to make sense as audience yes she's she felt guilty but i don't to be honest i don't think at this point she felt guilty it's just something that happens and then she's it started to open something else because she she's mm -hmm. loosened up and for example for chantal i will say if she loosen up she will fall apart but for magali if yeah. she loosen up she will open something which is really <laughs> not the same when you think about it right oh i love that and it's um it's wonderful to hear about some of those other moments on set that came sort of as a surprise in the process of yeah. working because i feel like those are so often where the good stuff comes up um totally. and I, I certainly think both of those shots you mentioned are are the good mm -hmm. stuff yes um, and it stays <laughs> in the film at the end it stays right Right. And um, in terms of Magali's sort of journey to opening herself up, like you were talking about, um, 
she's a character who seems to draw significant comfort from the music she listens to. She often retreats into her headphones in those moments of intense stress or trauma. Can you tell us a bit about how you chose the songs she's listening to and what your experience of curating the soundtrack was like? Um, she, it's, it's in such a weird and interesting process because we use the music as, um, as a tool to work uh, the, all the emotional journey of Magali between Emily Biard, the actress, and I. So we build up mm -hmm. a huge line, our storyline of Magali, and point some really um, a turning point in her journey. And for mm -hmm. each turning point, we put a, uh, a music or a specific song that she can go into and connect with with a really mm -hmm. specific emotion. So we did all this in prep. So we started to on set when it's all craziness and all that stuff. We look at each other. I give her the headphone and I said, okay, put this music. And she connect directly with one specific emotion wow. that we work in prep. So in a way we bounce between what was written in the script and the technique that we use together to get into those really specific emotions. So I should say that it, in post-production, it was a mix and match between what we wrote. Mm -hmm. For example, the, um, the song that she's listening when uh, uh, she's dancing with her baby, we choose that song mm -hmm. in the script. But all the other one, it was a mix and match of what we work with mm -hmm. and what's happened in, in the film, so. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's so cool, and I think, um... It's wonderful getting to hear about that collaboration with the actress because I think it's so clear watching the film that you, you know, had a really strong working relationship with her and that yes. um, I don't know how much she participated in the process of sort of crafting this character, but it really does feel like it emerges from something truthful in her and that's um, such a wonderful thing to see from such a young and incredibly talented performer. And she's so mature. She can understand a range of emotion that many adult actors cannot. She just su surprised me at every moment, every step. Every, she is amazing, really. Oh, I love that. Well, and you created something extremely powerful together. And Thanks. I highly recommend that everybody watching go out and um, watch our own, watch Les Nôtres. Um, it's a phenomenal movie and you don't want to miss it. Um, thank you so much, Jen, for taking the time to talk to me. I had such a wonderful time getting to hear about your process with this film. Um, and I want to go back and watch it again now, having heard you explain things about it, um, to pick up on some more of those, uh, especially the artistic references. Um, that was so interesting. So thank you so much for taking the time. Thanks and to I, you. Thank you again, Jen and Sienna, so much for joining us.